Planet Symposium. Um, my name is Cynthia Manette, and I organize this event because I participated in an exhibition in Alaska at the Anchorage Museum, which focused on the partnering of artists and scientists to address the issues of marine debris. It's called Gyre, the Plastic Ocean. And a gyre is a swirly, a vortex of ocean currents that traps all of the plastics and the fishing nets and the various things that are dumped into the sea around the world. And Alaska, in particular, is right at you know receives materials from the um, North Pacific gyre. And um, so I thought, well, we're often faced with so much. Oh, <laughs> hello, welcome to the class. <laughs> I totally forgot about the microphone. I'm so sorry. OK, so I'll just jump here to why I wanted to bring this idea here to Moore Park College, which is that when we're confronted with these realities of environmental devastation, of global warming, of deforestation, all of those various issues, it can be so disturbing that we can feel really helpless in the face of it. Like, what can we do? It's just everything is doomed. So I wanted to try and find some scientists and activists uh, who are helping to make a change that is positive, that can help us to learn about these issues in more detail and potentially discover ways that all of us as individuals might be able to um, help to at least address some of the problems. So we have first uh, presenting on the panel here is Dr. Jana Johnson, who teaches here at Moore Park College. She is a distinguished UCLA alum and nominee for the Indianapolis Prize. And her work is featured in the book, The Dangerous World of Butterflies. And she's going to tell us about her butterfly project, which is a fascinating uh, thing that she's been doing. Secondly, we have uh, Catherine Courtney, Professor Catherine Courtney, who teaches here also at Moore Park College, and she teaches field biology and botany, and she's going to talk some trash about the terrestrial environment. Uh, fourth, uh, third, we have Amy blount -Lay, who is an artist um, and an activist who works with um, school kids, right, elementary school children, on a project that she has called Plastic, the Real Sea Monster. Uh, I'll give you a little information about her. She received her BFA in painting from the University of Kansas in 1989, and her MFA in studio art from Cal Arts in 1994. Her work has been exhibited at various museums and galleries in Southern California, as well as internationally. Here's Catherine Courtney, very good. Um, and then the fourth speaker is <coughs> myself, Cynthia Manette, and I will tell you about my work and the work that I've presented in the um, Anchorage Museum as part of this exhibition. Um, after the presentations here, we're going to walk over to the campus gallery, to the Moore Park College Gallery, to see the Planet exhibition that I had the honor of putting together. And we will get to hear from the various artists in that. And I'm just going to tell you their names right here for our record. Um, we have Chris Baker, Lara Bank, Tawny Bowsmith, Mary Ann Cradure, Polly Grimm, Sandra Hunter, Anna Marie January, Amy Blount Lay, Mike Lewis, and Karina Monroy. So I'm really excited that all of those people have been able to give us works on various environmental themes, not just addressing, certainly, the concepts of marine debris. Also, I want to thank uh, some of the people involved in this. Uh, the media arts faculty, Svetlana Kasilovich, who included this in the Year of Technology and Humanity, which is a campus-wide learning um, uh, opportunities for sure for us here at Moore Park. And um, Susan Gardner designed the poster that you might see around. She did a really nice job on that. 
And I want to thank Erica Mazze and her gallery practices class because they spent a lot of time setting up the exhibition in the gallery. Okay, so without further ado, if we can welcome Jana Johnson. is my research. Uh, it's a joint effort between Moorpark College and the Urban Wildlands Group, which is a nonprofit organization. And basically, it's an ICU for endangered butterflies. It is housed at America's Teaching Zoo. And the first species that arrived there was the Palos Verdes Blue Butterfly, which is a listed species. It's your typical butterfly. If you've ever heard Eric Carle's uh, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, <laughs> You'll start off as an egg, and then you're going to hatch, and you're going to be a caterpillar, and you're going to eat and grow, and then you're going to pupate, and then you're going to form a butterfly and eat clothes. And when you eat clothes, you have to expand your wings and have them harden, and then you get to have sex and produce more offspring. Yes? All right, so the Palos Verdes uh, blue butterfly is a very picky eater. The caterpillars will only eat two plants. It was first thought it would only eat one plant, but it actually eats two. That's not a lot. You're a specialist, yes? Mm -hmm. Secondly, it has always been restricted in its distribution. It uh, was restricted by the last ice age. It's been on the Palos Verdes Peninsula for the last 10,000 years without anybody else, and that's it. So it is very genetically unique. Um, it's always been rare. Rarity does not necessarily mean that humankind has done anything wrong. But this particular species, specialist, restricted in distribution, in a spot where it had high numbers, thousands and thousands, but it was crashed because this is what's happened to the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Development, habitat destruction. And there's nowhere else for it to go. So. It basically dwindled to one population, one population of 7,000 individuals. It was protected by the Endangered Species Act. It should not have been bothered. However, they wanted to develop the land. And Rancho Palos Verdes knew that it was there. They knew that it was listed and protected. And they bulldozed it anyway and put in baseball diamond. That wiped it out. The US Fish and Wildlife Service did try to prosecute. And they took them to court. However, they charged Rancho Palos Verdes and then listed the names of the officials. And at the time, they hired a really smart lawyer, and the lawyer said that the Endangered Species Act says that you can prosecute person or persons, not a municipality. And so it was thrown out on a technicality. There was not a dollar in, in fines. There was not a day of jail time. And they could not prosecute the individuals because that would have been double jeopardy because they had been listed on the first complaint. So, this is the species that changed the Endangered Species Act. Because of this court case, the only silver lining that came out of that is that the ESA law was modified, and now you can't argue that you're an entity and therefore don't have to abide by the laws. So that's the butterfly we're talking about. It was presumed extinct for 11 years, and it's not like there weren't people to look. <laughs> It's very uh, populated, and there are a whole bunch of entomologists around, and they did. They looked everywhere, and for 11 years, they could not find it. It remained on the ESA list, and that's why, if you're wondering that something has been extinct, and you're like, why is it still listed on there? Because if you find it again, it's immediately protected. If you take it off the list because you think it's extinct, and then you find it, it's not protected. You have to go through the whole process of getting it listed again. So even when you think it's extinct, you leave it on the list so that if you rediscover it, it's protected. Well, because it was still on the list, uh, well, it got out of order in my story. There's one place on the peninsula they could not look. And that one place that they could not look was a military base. Still is a military base. Very secure facility with a great fence line. A fence line that is so smart that it can tell you if somebody just leaned against it, shook it, 
They're cutting it with pliers. It knows how to interpret vibrations in itself. It's a crazy fence line. Yes? So you couldn't go there. Well, what is this space? This space is actually a fuel depot. It's a whole bunch of fuel. And it is owned by the Navy, but it is rented by DLA, Defense Logistics Agency, which is an interagency entity. So the commander of the base is from the Air Force, but it's overseen by the Army, and it's owned by the Navy. Did I miss anybody? No. <laughs> right? So this fuel is for all the branches of the military. Everybody needs fuel. That's why they have all the different branches present. And usually when you see fuel, it looks like this, yes? Okay, but there was this little thing called World War II. And in World War II, they were afraid that Japan was gonna fly these planes over and bomb the depot. So they buried the tanks. That's a tank. They're underground tanks now because in World War II, they buried them to try to prevent them from being blown up because if all our branches had no fuel, that would be a problem in a war, yes? But when they buried them, they didn't landscape them. So whatever moved in, moved in. Now there are, I'm not telling you it's the perfect landscape. <laughs> there are definitely invasives there, but it's not all landscaping invasives. <clears throat> there are some natural, native, endemic species there, including food plants. And because there was food plant there, when they needed to put in another pipeline, they had to do what's known as an EIR, an Environmental Impact Report. And my predecessor, Dr. Rudy Matoni, went out there with Rick Rogers, who is a brilliant entomologist. He will ID a fly on the wing at the back of this auditorium. It's crazy. He is gifted. And when they went out, to do the EIR, they didn't think they were going to find anything, but they happened across one last population of 65. So it wasn't extinct. It was still listed and protected, which means now that you have a partnership with Navy, Army, Air Force, Moorpark College, the Urban Wildlands Group, and PVPLC, which is the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, who does all the restoration work on the peninsula. That's a lot of people working on this butterfly, yes? <laughs> Uh, for about a decade, we were breaking even. I shouldn't even say we. I wasn't on the project at that point. That was under Dr. Rita Matoni. And we had about 200 in the wild and about 200 in captivity. I joined as a grad student. I needed a job. He needed a grad student. It was a match made in heaven. Started working on the butterflies. That did eventually become my uh, dissertation. So if you ever come to my office and see my UCLA degree for my PhD, you'll see that it's a picture of the blue. Not a picture of me. It's all about them. So, uh, we still broke even. For three years I worked under him and we did the same methods. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. It just wasn't working. So in 2006, I uh, thank you to so many people who worked together and said, could you just let her experiment with a few and do something different? 18 females is what I was approved to experiment with, and I changed methods. And at the end of that season, <coughs> we had 720. Wow. That was awesome. Actually, I cried a lot because there were a lot of them. <laughs> and I was working alone. That's kind of scary. 720, I now have enough that I can open up a second site. And the ESA law had changed since uh, the blue first came into captive rearing. And we were supposed to have two sites, so that if one site explodes because there's underground fuel underneath us, or whatever, right, uh, that you have a second site, that you're not wiped out. So you're supposed to have at least two sites when you're working on a species. And now we had enough that we could subdivide the captive population and do that. And where did I bring half of them? I brought half of them here in 2007. And I had between eight and ten students that were helping me out because my methods that I developed with the 18 individuals are labor intensive. It's a labor of love. Uh, you cannot say that I saved this butterfly. I did not save this butterfly. A team saved this butterfly. There is no way to do this solo. You have to have teamwork. Um, with that team, and they're all very hands-on, and these include majors across the board, 
We hand feed, we keep the predators out. Uh, they end up going into little, we call them condos. <laughs> They're actually ketchup containers, but to them it's a condo. Uh, and we're in the middle of feeding these, so these have been cleaned out and are waiting for their fresh food for that day. And with those, eight to 10 folks working real hard, and I only brought 350 of them north, but at the end of that season, we had 4,513 individuals. That's teamwork, yes? yes? And experimenting and trying something a little bit new. With 4,513 individuals, now you can not only be a refugium so that extinction is not uh, as big a threat, not only can you do research so that you can have a better understanding of the species, you can also release back to the wild and start propping up that population and release to other spots to try to establish a meta population so that it can be self-sustaining. It's my job to work myself out of a job. And I would really love it if we were the first ones, first insects, to downlist or delist. Uh, we're in the process of moving that direction. We have released in one spot multiple years and now we're not releasing there and they still flew there this year. So that is encouraging because that would mean that instead of being an experimental population, if it can keep doing that, it will be a new wild population that didn't exist before our team. That kicks ass. Yes? Pardon my language, sorry. Okay. Uh, we do release all uh, forms of life. Sometimes we, we release pupa. We don't really move, you just place them. <laughs> uh, we release butterflies and everybody comes for that. That's CBS filming Mandy. That's my science director and that's PVPLC in the background. Everybody comes, everybody plays, it's all fun. Uh, butterflies are charismatic, so that's helpful. We also release larvae. I love releasing larvae. It's kind of like releasing little, they remind me of dogs. I'm a dog person. They're just so mastiffy. I have mastiffs. They're wrinkly and they're big and they're fat and they're happy. And they just want to eat something and sleep. So that's a mastiff. <laughs> so, you really love it as well. Rarely do people film that because they don't walk real fast. <laughs> because of the success with that butterfly, we had a second butterfly come in house. That's Lang's Metal Mark butterfly. Lang's Metal Mark butterfly, same deal, right? Eric Carl, you have an egg, the egg hatches, you get a larva. The larva eats and grows and eats and grows and pupates and then it will eclose and make an adult that needs to have sex so we can get eggs again. Yes? Yes. Okay. This time, instead of just south of LAX, we had to go north. It is limited. It is from a dune system, an alluvian dune system near Antioch. And there's a wind that comes down the San Joaquin River and through time it built up huge sand dunes. And on these sand dunes was a whole suite of endemic species that were really cool. But you might have noticed just from the map, but here you go a little bit closer up, this is all we have left. Two little pieces of property here and here. And in the middle, this is a gypsum plant and an electricity facility. That's it. This whole thing used to be huge, 100-foot tall sand dunes. This is what we have left. It's habitat destruction again. And I do understand that the species I work with were never common. But they weren't on the verge of extinction. We're the ones pushing them over the edge. So it was always a specialist. It only eats buckwheat. It was always restricted. It was only on these really cool alluvian dunes where the San Joaquin River comes by there with a nice big wind. Um, but it was in high numbers until we destroyed the habitat. And not only did we develop it, but if you ever go to San Francisco and you see brick buildings that have yellow bricks, that's our sand. So when the earthquake wiped out San Francisco to rebuild what you need is sand. Where was the closest sand? Antioch. So they took those 100 foot tall sand dunes down to dead pan soil. And if you change the substrate, the plants are going to change, and if the plants change, the animals are going to crash. So it's kind of a domino effect. So that doesn't exactly look like 100 foot tall sand dunes anymore, right? No. <laughs> Not to mention that's all grass, invasive grass. 
not supposed to be there. K, uh, of those two properties, this one, the butterfly has been extirpated. It's not there anymore. It's only on this one. That makes a little bit of sense because this is the property where they are not anymore. This is where they still are. There are some dunes there. They are covered in invasive species. But there is still some topography and there is the proper substrate. So that's the last hanging on population. Um, we care for all of them by hand. We go up in uh, September, end of August, beginning of September. We collect foundresses. We get as many eggs off of the foundresses as we can. We care for those eggs all the way from September through February. The hatch is in February. Now those eggs, we map them, and you have to look through a little loop to see the eggs, because these are the eggs, and this is using a macro lens. Very, very small. And some of the eggs will fully hatch, some of the eggs will never hatch, and some of the ha eggs will partially hatch, which is a really depressing situation where the larva started to hatch and ran out of energy or something. We don't know exactly why, but they just quit and die in the egg. Very depressing moment, yeah? Okay, and then we have to continue to take care of them as they are larva. I showed you a big, happy, chunky, fat larva. This is what comes out of the egg. See that black dot on my hand? That's a first instar. And they're kind of scary to work with because they're tiny and anything you can do to, to them will injure them. So we try not to handle them, but if the plant that they are uh, sheltering on is dying, we've got to get them onto fresh plants so they have something to eat. And so we have to relocate them. And we take detailed notes on everything. And the students are hands-on with all of this um, so that they are learning about research and they are learning about data and they are processing the, da processing the data and as long as they have worked on the paper, they get a publication. And several of my students have several publications. So that I think one of the great things is that you can do something. You can step onto a project and not only give back to the earth, but get something out of it as well, which is an education and opportunities and growing your resume. So I'm a firm believer in the NOW now principle, which is no opportunity wasted. Take advantage of the opportunities because there are some crazy ones out there. Yeah? Okay. Save yourself in addition to the butterflies. Okay. Uh, we also have monthly meetings. We do think tank meetings. So everybody, the latest, newest person to the team is totally free to offer their suggestions. Um, I felt that part of the problem when I came on to butterfly conservation was that we were stuck with expertitis, uh, where we were just doing the same thing over and over and over because it had worked with other species in the past. So obviously it's not the, the methods, it's, it's something's wrong with the, the caterpillar. No, you just have to adjust for each situation. Does that make sense? So I think think tanks are really important so that everybody can contribute and you may not just be thinking about what needs to change to make it better. With that, we have produced hundreds, not thousands. We still have issues with getting them to breed. They are so picky. We have tried everything in the honeymoon suite. <laughs> they just. Uh, with pandas, I know sometimes they show them what's called panda porn, and that helps out. Uh, that's just the only thing we haven't tried. We even tried playing some Barry White and um, some <laughs> music, just to see if we could, like, you know, get some vibrations in there and get things. It's hard. We are the only facility that has ever bred them. Uh, we've had them in the house for seven years. Only two of those years have we succeeded in having them breed. It's crazy part. But we have had hundreds, so we do get to release to the wild, and we do sometimes release butterflies, and sometimes we release pupa. We tend not to release larvae anymore. Um, larvae are very prone to getting eaten. They are definitely on the prey list. They're on the menu, and I don't want to lay out snossages when I'm not producing thousands. So we wait until they're either reproductively ready to make more, or they are in a hard, crunchy <laughs> pupil protection. <coughs> With the success
success of those two species, we had a third species come in the house. This is kind of unheard of. Usually you hear of people working on one species, and you might hear of them dabbling on a second species. Bringing a third species in the house is crazy. Uh, third species is Laguna Mountain Skipper. It's from Palomar Mountain, which is down near, oh, somebody help San me. Diego. San Diego. Awesome. Palomar Mountain. Uh, you look at Palomar Mountain and you might go, what's the problem? We're not sure exactly what the problem is. Everybody has their favorite hypothesis as to what's going on. Some of the problems on Palomar Mountain is that there, is, there are a lot of cattle. And so uh, the food plant, it's a specialist again. It is restricted. It's Palomar Mountain and Laguna Mountain, but it's already been extirpated on Laguna Mountain, so it's gone there. So it's only on Palomar Mountain. Um, so there, it, my field guy, Ken, right there, is convinced that it is the cattle trampling the horkelia, which is a low-growing plant that's in the sloughs where it's kind of moist and the cattle like to go there. And so he's convinced that the cattle are damaging it with their feet. Last time I was out there, I saw a lot of the rust. And so I'm concerned that there is an element of a pathophysiology for the plant. Um, there's another thing happening in the mountains down there that I don't know if you're aware of or not. And I, and I use my pointer and pick on you. Me? That right there. See that right there? <laughs> you know where that water in that bottle might have come from? The mountains. So it's huge business up there in Palomar Mountain to lease your property to a company that goes up there, pumps the water out, bottles it, and takes it down. The water table is dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And these horkelia are in the sloughs where you need moisture. And without the moisture, the population of the food plant is crashing. And if you don't have food plant, you don't have butterflies. There could be other things, too. This one tested positive for Wolbachia. Wolbachia is a bacterium that causes problems with reproduction. So when it's in house, not only do we have a third species in house, but I have a third species in house that has a reproductive disease <laughs> in a breeding facility. That's crazy. <laughs> yes? So then we have all of these protocols as to what order you work on and what you do to sanitize yourself. And if anything ever has LMS written on it, it never gets used again with PVB or LMB because I don't want Wolbachia to jump into my other species. That would be horrible. But we're working on it. We're working on it. Now this one is also really hard. So we brought in three individuals. One was so old that she passed away that evening with no eggs collected. Uh, another individual we caught, that's her mating. It's very hard to tell males from females, so you actually catch anything that flies by, bring it in, <laughs> then ID it, and then you release the boys, because it's so hard to tell them apart. Well, while we had them in the handling container, <laughs> apparently we had a little boy and a little girl. <laughs> they hooked up. It was a great mating. It lasted long enough. It should have been fabulous. We transferred them into a smaller container that we use for the female. They hooked up again, second mating. I was ecstatic. Young female, two matings. I know this is my winner, my lottery ticket. All of her eggs collapsed. I'm willing to bet she has Wolbachia. Or her mate had Wolbachia. The weird thing with Wolbachia is that if you both have Wolbachia, you're fine. But if only one has Wolbachia, then everything is infertile. I was so mad. Yes? And our third individual was a pretty old lady, and we only got a few eggs off of her. Now they hatched, and they went all the way through to pupa, and we're waiting to see if they close this April right now. They're due. But those are the challenges you face, and you sit around in think tanks going, what the? <laughs> Help. So Butterfly Project wants you to help with the recovery. Please vote smart. I don't have anything against baseball diamonds. I really don't. I do have something against putting them on top of the last population of an endangered species. Bad choice. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Two, limit your use of aesthetics. I don't know if you're reading all of the literature out there, but it's everywhere. Aside means death. So perhaps we should be 
thinking about it before we're using them liberally. Okay, plant a 7-Eleven. A 7-Eleven for butterflies, there's plenty of resources that will tell you what flowers have high nectar, and butterflies are generalists, they just want some nectar. So you can plant a butterfly garden and have everybody come through and visit you as they are picking up something along their road trip. Yes? That's if you can't handle, that's if you can't handle having their babies eat your garden. <laughs> I would prefer that what you plant is a nursery. But I have visited homes and people have said, look, this is my butterfly garden. And it really looked lovely, but look at it now. There are just these caterpillars all over eating it. And I'm like, that's the vote of confidence in your garden. That's what they're supposed to do. If you plant food plants, not only are they going to get some nectar, they're going to leave their babies with you, and their babies are going to eat your plants. But that's really cool, too, because then you can see all the life stages. You can see the egg, the larva, the pupa, and the adult right before it flies off. And then you really help the population. You didn't just, you know, offer them a bottle of water on their highway trip. You said, leave your kids with me. I'll take care of them. And you got them all the way through college and sent them off. Right? <laughs> so if you can tolerate your garden looking a little chewed, I'd prefer you do a nursery. Uh, plant wisely. In every single case, there are exotic, invasive species out there, and they are wicked to conquer once they're out there. So uh, I drive pa past this, this van with this ad on the side, and it says, know the joy of exotics. And I just <laughs> die inside. Know the joy of natives. Know the joy of natives. Okay. Uh, also, consider being a butterfly propagation, propagation technician. Boy, that's hard. That's a mouthful. Butterfly propagation technician. Those are my interns. Those are the Moorpark College students who are working on the project here. If you're interested, I have six internships available this summer. I've only had one person contact me so far. Um, I'm going to do a meeting on May 6th, 1 p.m. at the zoo gate because you're not allowed to just walk onto the zoo. So we'll meet at the zoo gate and then I'll escort you in. If you can't make that, we'll do a bankup meeting the, exact, the next day at the exact same time and spot. It's a tendency of what we do in case you're a Monday, Wednesday class person or a Tuesday, Thursday class person. Finally, be kind to yourself. Support each other because seriously, without a team, you can't accomplish anything, in my humble opinion. Be kind to the planet and be a part of the solution, not the problem, while living to your fullest now. No opportunity wasted, folks. I did not get, it was helter-skelter how I got here, but it's pretty cool now that I'm here, and that pathway has been fascinating. Yes? Any questions? Sorry I didn't answer you. No, it's okay. Um, I know somebody who does have a butterfly guard, and she said it's, it's so cool just seeing all the production and everything you go through. Yeah. And her home's just like open to like the public basically just to go see his house and stuff. Ever since I planted my butterfly garden, the number of butterflies in the neighborhood has skyrocketed. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Your microphone's not on. Oh, it's only feeding to the camera. We probably should have shared that with you. This is for the camera, not for you, which is why I'm still projecting. Any other questions, comments, concerns, clarifications? Yes, ma'am? Um, well, I guess I could Online, but how would you plant butterflies, butterfly plants that are natives and still protect them from birds, for their larvae and such? Like, is there anything that you can You're asking how to protect the butterflies from their predators? Yes. Uh, in order to do that, you have to do things that are very unnatural. I mean, you saw that what we do is they are in these boxes. Where is it? Yeah. They're in these boxes with ant baths and plexi and screening and all sorts of things. So it's not, one, it's not very attractive. <laughs> and two, um, yeah, we're a prey species. So the good news is that if you plant it, they will come and they will leave so many progeny that even if a bird snacks a few, you can keep going. Um, <coughs> but it is, it is a question that's asked repeatedly, especially when we're releasing. My current uh, commander went to a release, and the next day she went back to visit um, 
There was a Phoebe that had been busy. So there was a little pile of wings. Um, and she took pictures of all the wings and sent them to me. And uh, I wrote her back and I told her it's okay because they were all males. Which sounds really horrible. <laughs> but every last wing that she sent me a picture of was a male butterfly wing. And females and males only have to breed once and then the female is gravid for life because she gets a whole package of sperm and then she just uses it as she needs it. <laughs> <laughs> so we look for silver linings and realize that we're a prey species. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions, comments, concerns, clarifications? Uh, do you have a link or recommended site to find what are the like the high nectar plants? I will soon. So one of my interns actually is building my faculty website right now, and I do have a trifold of information of what to plant for a nursery versus a 7-Eleven, and that will all be posted hopefully by the end of this semester, but if not, then he's rolling it into an independent study for the summer, so hopefully by fall, <laughs> and then you'll be able to go there. So just look for me once I'm up and running. Uh, California Plant, uh, Native Plant Society also has wonderful information. That's where I hijack all my info. May 6th, though, what time are you meeting? 1 p.m. 1 p.m., okay. At the zoo gate. Okay. Where'd it go? There it is. And if you can't make it May 6th, May 7th, 1 p.m., zoo gate. And I'll take you on a short tour so you can see the facilities, and I'll talk to you about, I mean, from the pictures, you should realize you're hands-on with everything. You're doing everything. And as long as you've earned 20 hours on site, then you can go on releases. And we do releases. We do trips down to, uh, obviously, San Pedro with the Palos Verdes Blue. Uh, we're about to go down to Palomar Mountain again to collect LMS again. And uh, come <clears throat> July, August, September, we'll be headed up for multiple trips to Antioch. So you can go in the field as well. For um, sorry, in the interest of time, last Thanks, question. Okay. Um, for the Saturday volunteer, do we meet at the zoo gate? For the that? Saturday volunteer, which uh, is a two-hour opportunity, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. every Saturday. Uh, one, you have to sign up on my door because I limit it to four. My door is LMC 215. Uh, don't scratch somebody else's name out because that's going to cause problems. <laughs> And I give those names to my intern who tells the ticket booth that you're with us and then you can get past the ticket booth without paying and you walk down the front row of the zoo until you find wooden butterfly wings and you take a picture real quick and then you, that's where we meet you at 11 a.m. and bring you in. Dress appropriately. It's outside. It's dirty. It can be hot. It can be cold. It can be wet. And bring some water. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, so next we'd like to welcome Catherine Courtney. I'll project. Hi, my name is Catherine Courtney, and I teach biology here at Moorpark College. I also teach botany and field biology. And um, when I heard about this uh, project, I uh, wanted to talk about trash at first, and then I uh, want to talk about something that's a little bit more uh, I'm passionate about, and that's called trashing the environment. 
And so, um, trashed, it can mean lots of things. As you, as you guys know, it can mean being stoned or drunk. But um, <laughs> it's informal, chiefly North American, and it means to damage, vandalize, and wreck. And um, I'm, what I'm really going to talk about is inadvertent trashing of the environment, not deliberate trashing of the environment. The other thing I wanted you guys to know is that I'm a scientist. And you know I like precise things. And I like measurements, and I like to be strict, and things like that. But what really motivated me to become a scientist is this. Beauty. Um, flowers in particular. And when I was a kid, I used to go hiking around up in the Bay Area on Mount Diablo. And I loved looking at wildflowers and climbing the trees and the rocks and all that stuff. And I, that's what I fell in love with. And California is an amazing place. And all the pictures I'm going to show you are in California, pictures I've taken or my boyfriend took. And there's that. Do you guys know what that is? That's Point Doom on a beautiful day. It almost looks like Hawaii to me. And this is up in the San Gabriel Mountains on some dirt road. Anyway, that's it's beautiful. These, you guys know what these trees are? This is a bristlecone pines. And some of um, they're the oldest living individual species in the world, because we have colonial species. And that's a dead standing one, but that one is still alive. And they're thousands of years old. And I don't know if anybody knows this plant. It's a very special plant. It only grows at very, very high elevation. It's called sky pilot. So you have to be above 10 or 12,000 feet to see it up in the Sierras. Anyway, all these pictures are California, and they're all beautiful. And one of the main things is there's no trash in sight. And you know, California deserves not to be trashed, or any place on the earth. And so you know, I spend a lot of time hanging out in the Santa Monica Mountains, and I see stuff like, oops, not this. Isn't this beautiful? This is up in the Redwood Forest in Big Sur. Aren't those gorgeous? But this is what I see in Santa Monica Mountains. And um, here, somebody has clearly damaged, vandalized, or wrecked the area. And to be honest, this is right off of Mulholland Road. And you guys have driven on Mulholland Road, right? And Mulholland is not the most beautiful place in the world. And the Santa Monica Mountains are kind of scrappy, and there's not a lot of water, and you know. But you, you got to look close. And what I want you guys to know is I took this picture, but a few feet behind me on the trail, I saw a portion of the back home trail, this is what I saw. A really beautiful flower. It's called Plumber's. Um, I can't remember the name. <laughs> but anyway, Plumber's Mariposa Lily. That's it. Plumber's Mariposa Lily. Isn't that beautiful? And a little bit farther behind me on the trail is this plant. And so there's beauty everywhere. And our, like I said, our environment, you know, it deserves to be treated well. And you know, I think most of us, I think most of us, you know, don't intentionally go out and trash the environment. But sometimes we do inadvertently, and that's what I wanted to talk about. And um, I took this picture two weeks ago with my field biology class. We talked about the red forest, and it was absolutely spectacular. And we went, this was just halfway to a waterfall where I took my class, and it was beautiful. We were having lots of fun, and I, we were reviewing the names of trees and all the ecological features of the area and the adaptation, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the students are like skipping around. <laughs> They're so happy and so pretty. Um, but then I see that on the trail. Okay? And I think this is something that a lot of people do and they don't realize it. And I used to do this too. When you eat food, um, you got to take it with you. If you can pack it in, you can pack it out. And even though a banana peel is biodegradable, it takes a long time for it to degrade. And it looks like crap until it degrades. And, you know, so it's trashed. If it's not where it wants, if it's something where you don't want it to be, it's trash. And that's trash. And, you know, just take it with you and tell people. And that's what I'm telling you. You know, you can gently tell people. Or with your actions, you can not throw away your apple core, but take it, you know, if you went on a picnic lunch, you have a little baggie or something, take your abacore with you and pick up all your bottles, which you do. You'll, t you'll pick up your bottles, you pick up your cans, 
you'll pick up your plastic bag, but now I'm asking you to pick up your fruit peels and, and things like that because it's trash. And um, here's another place. Earlier this semester, I took my class to some oases in the desert. We have oases. Has anybody ever been to them? And not only are there oases, but they have water in them and fruit of the trees you can eat and all kinds of critters. So here's a happy camper there, and we're looking at it. And um, this is looking back out. There's water here, and this is last year's crew taking a little bath. In the, it's a really lovely, beautiful place, and a wonderful place to teach about desert ecology and things like that. And as we hike, I'm going over and having them memorize the name of the plants and talking about the ecological adaptations and the problems that plants face in the area and animals as well. And often I stop, and this is what I see. Orange peels. And I really, really, I love oranges, but I really, really hate orange peels because you know where I see them? I see them everywhere. And now you will too. I see them at the beginning of the trailhead. Like there'll be a garbage can and there's a trail and there's a pile of orange peels. And then I will see, you know, a trail and a nice place to sit down, you know, like some rocks, you know, place to rest. And I'll see a pile of orange peels. Then I'll be out in the desert. And what do I see in a beautiful site? A pile of orange peels. And orange peels are full of chemicals, natural chemicals, that resist bacteria. And you guys know what I'm talking about. You know when you squeeze an orange peel and it comes like a shower of essence? Those are called essential oils. And they smell great, but they're toxic to bacteria. So orange peels take an inordinate amount of time to decompose. And so <laughs> I just see orange peels everywhere. <laughs> and my students, one year I went, every time I saw an orange peel, I would kind of you know, have a little epileptic fit and go off on it. But I was trying to impress on them that it's garbage and that nothing should be left behind, ever. Now sometimes we drop things accidentally, I know that. You know, we, but if you purposely put them there, that's a drag. Right? So if you pack it in, what are you going to do? Take it pack it out. Exactly. So anyway, so for human waste, you got to go. We all got to go. Uh, deposit solid human waste in cat holes six to eight inches deep, at least 200 feet, maybe more, from water, your camp, and trails. So people don't step in it and you know, discover it the hard way. But the thing is, what you want to do is you want to keep it away from water sources. A, keep them beautiful and clear like that. And B, so you can swim and everything. And C, you just don't want to see it, you know? Um, if you're going to wash your, yourself or your dishes, carry water 200 feet away from streams or lakes, and use small amounts of biodegradable soap. So you're not going to bathe in the creek. You're going to take a little bucket of water and away. Or just be, you know, just do what I do, and you just don't bathe. <laughs> and it keeps away the animals. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, we've got to keep the water clean, because one, it's beautiful, and the fish need the beautiful water. But we're drinking it, too. And here are my friends pumping the water, you know, for our drinking water supply. And, um, you know, I can't say enough good things about, you know, clean water and keeping it, keeping it that way so we can all enjoy it. Right. Um, toilet paper. If you can pack it in, you can pack it out. Uh, I'll, get to the, I'll get to the other part in a second. I, you just take a little baggie, and you got two baggies, one with the fresh toilet paper and one with the used toilet paper. And you just, yeah, it gets bad, but you put it in and you zip it up and it's okay. And, just remember to take it out of your backpack or your pocket or something. <laughs> but you can throw your orange peels in there too. You know, whatever. Whatever. But uh, I spend a lot of time in the out of doors and I have to whiz a lot. And I go, you know, there'll be like a, a spot in the, you know what I'm talking about. It looks like a good spot to take a whiz. And you go there and there's piles of paper. It's not pretty, you know, so take it with you. Um, anyway, if it's solid, you can try the natural route. Now, the best is a smooth stone. Just saying. <laughs> um, you don't like what a rocky stone or something that's brittle or something like that. A smooth one like that's polished from a river. You know, cobblestone, right? Um, and if it's warm, it's nice. 
Uh, some people use sticks. I don't get the stick. I am not into the stick because sticks have got prickly things on it, like branches and stuff, you know. And there are plants out there with contact or you know poisons. I can't believe I'm going to say this, but people use a special kind of loofah and just wash it off in the river, not minding. No, oh, but the, but that's defeating the purpose. <laughs> that's I mean I know what you're I. I hope that's well, it's not country. always a river. They can like carry a bucket. Why? Well, I don't know. Well, <laughs> um, so anyway, leaves. You got to be careful with the leaves. Make sure you get a plant that doesn't give you contact dermatitis, like poison oak. Okay, so you can learn the plant. And I, in my field bio class, I point out going this one would make a good tofu bear. Stay away from that one. But you got to be careful about that. The stick thing, like I said, I can't see it. But I had a student that swore by it. I don't. That's all the end of discussion with that one. But um, I will tell you what most of the world uses, water. And uh, this is what I did when I spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia, particularly India, is you get a cup or a bowl, and it was hard if your hands are full, but anyway, you do your thing, and you take the cup with your right hand, and you drizzle it down the crack of your butt, and with your left hand, you slosh, 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 slosh. Okay, away from the body of water, away from a creek, away from a lake, you know, away from it. Because obviously that's now polluted with human feces. And then you wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water. And then you're good to go. Soap and water will cure everything, okay? But um, anyway, just pack out the paper. All right? <laughs> yeah, smooth stones. All right. Um, now, I know we were talking about trash, but I had to talk about wildlife. I hope that's all right. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one of the things um, that, you know, I say plants. And the reason I say <coughs> plants is because they don't bite you. And they're, you go back next year and the same plant is there. You know, you get to see it. Animals are much harder to observe in the wild. But if you respect wildlife, the probability of you seeing them is higher. And I was very stoked that last year, my field bio class saw this guy. And you guys know what this critter is called? It's a pica. It's a pica. It's related to a rabbit. And they only live at very high elevation. And we were hiking around at very, very high elevation. And I was hiking slow because it was high elevation. So I was hiking slow with the smokers, you know. And the uh, old. And the young bucks were like scampering ahead. And they're like, calf, calf, we found a pica. And I'm like, no way. They probably find a marmot. Do you guys know what a marmot is? Yeah. And I'm like, they probably saw a marmot. I, I don't believe it. But anyway, I got, I finally slugged up there, you know. <laughs> you know. And there it was, it was pica. It was very cute, and it's, you know, it's a special thing to see. And, um, and they did, the, you know what, they were great, because the pica, they didn't like go after the pica or lunge at it or anything like that. They kind of just, they saw it, and they walked really slowly and very quietly and just hung out until... And well, until I got to come up there and take a picture of the pica. And so there are my students, and there's a pica. You see it right there? <laughs> They're cutest like that. And um, this was just a fortuitous thing where the pica popped up right near them and was not shy. And, um, but the thing is, is observe wildlife from a distance. And, my, and I have a camera, I have a lot of mini cameras, and I have a camera with. I have some telephoto lenses, but I have some with digital zoom lenses, which are not the best cameras, but when you're hiking around, you know, it lets you zoom in on the animal because you can't get close to it. And anyway, it was a really special moment that they got to see, and the whole class got to see. Um, so anyway, like I said, you want to be respectful to wildlife and avoid wildlife during sensitive times, like if they're mating. Especially if they're butterflies and you know they're having a hard time, <laughs> um, or raising young, or it's the winter time when there's less, uh, you know, less resources. And here, do you guys know what these things are? They're banana slugs, and that's our state mollusk. And they're mating, and they're hermaphrodites, so they both fertilize each other. And uh, what's really cool about them, this guy found it cool, is. Uh, they both mate with each other. They both they kind of impregnate each other, and then make sure that they don't mate with any others 
they chew each other's penises off so that then <laughs> it's a strategy. And anyway, they're very slimy. And let me tell you, if you pick up a banana slug, they're incredibly slimy, and you're like, oh, I can wash this off in a creek fish. It actually takes a long time. So is that it? No more penis, or do they grow enough? I think it grows back. Oh, good. It grows back. <laughs> but I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, um, you know, so I tell my students, you never count on seeing animals, it's just fortuitous if you get to see them or not. And I tell them to look. Uh, like if we want to see bighorn sheep or something like that, I tell them to look at the mountain ridges and try to see the bighorn sheep in silhouette. Because a lot of times the males kind of hang out on the ridge lines, kind of looking down to see, make sure people left, and so they can go down to the oasis to drink water. And so also, oops, that's an up close view. There, that's one of the penis there. That's their air hole. Anyway, check this out. <laughs> So last year, we we're hiking down from the oasis, and um, so we're walking in a valley, and there's two ridge lines, and I'm looking at the far ridge lines, and again, all the fast students hauled us, and um, me and the slow students were walking, and we had our binoculars, so we take a few steps and put our binoculars up, take a few steps, put our binoculars up, and sure enough, we could see on the horizon silhouettes of sheep picking their way down to the rocks, picking their way down to the rocks, you know. And so we were kind of oblivious to our own trail, because again, we were taking a few steps and looking up. And this is what I saw. Now, I have a super zoom on my camera. And so here is a mother sheep. And there's a baby. See that baby? And there's a baby. And there's another baby right there. And you can see that they look just like the rocks. Okay. But anyway, we were, so uh, again, we're taking a few steps, and we're kind of quiet looking up at those sheep, taking a few steps, looking up at the sheep, taking a few steps, looking at the sheep. And the guy behind me, he goes, Kath, Kath, look. Because I'm like, I'm like, what? And he goes, look in front of you. Bam. There's, <laughs> I'm like, what? You know, and, and then and there's a sheep right there. And then um, he's like, and so I'm like taking pictures, click, 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 click. And then he goes, Kath, 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 to the left. And I go, and there's another sheep up there. I didn't add that picture, but I was, we were surrounded by him. And the key was being quiet and not too, you know, chattery and, not have any dogs and stuff in our group, and that's how you get to see animals. And then, you know, but having binoculars helps too. And it's just fortuitous that we got to run into these guys. But anyway, one of the things I want to tell you guys about, if you ever go to the desert, there are lots of different oases around. They've got water, and they're really, really cool places in the, in the desert um, because there's lots of pretty plants. And animals visit oases because that's their only source of water. But do not go there at night. That's when we should allow them to have their time. Because you imagine if you're a skittish animal and you know, people are hanging around the oasis all day and all night, then they never get to drink water and they can die of thirst. You know, we can like, oh, I feel thirsty, and hike the hell out of there, drive and go somewhere and get something. That's not an option for them. That's like their only. So just be respectful of any signs and Use your common sense about letting animals have a chance. Because there's a lot of people in this world, and animals need their break. And the plants, too. Um, this is just showing, you know, look at animals from a distance. Get yourself a pair of binoculars. They don't even have to be really super good ones or a camera or something like that. But anyway, this is a place I take my class called the Desert Tortoise Preserve. And here's a man. He's filming, and he's filming this guy which looks like that. That's a horned lizard. People call them horny toads. But they're horned lizards, and they're adorable. And um, because they look like little mini tri triceratops. And um, they actually, you know, they hang out. And um, they can move fast for a few feet, and then they have to rest. And then they move fast for a few feet, and then they have to rest. So they're kind of easy to catch. And that's one of their downfalls, because people think they're cool. They capture them. If I can capture them, anyone can capture them. And they take them home for pets. But they don't survive very well at home, because they're very picky eaters. They only eat native ants. You can't just feed them anything. And so that's my other, well, I mean, I have lots of messages. But one of the messages is, leave animals alone. Take pictures of them, watch the heck out of them, and with digital photography, you can take pictures of them, you know, a thousand pictures of them. 
because photons are cheap. <laughs> and um, and because they have rebounded so much, and like you go to the beach and you're for sure to see hundreds of them. So, you know, people respect animals, they do well. Um, protect wildlife and your food by storing rations and trash securely. I don't know if you can see, but that's a bear, a young bear. And I took this picture last summer up in Sequoia. And um, first of all, if you've got, gone to the mountains recently, they have bear boxes where you put absolutely everything from your car and your tent in the bear box. Chapstick, you know, candy, gum, can of shampoo, anything that smells fruity and all types of food go in the bear box. The bear, the bear boxes cannot be broken into by bears, but your car can and your tent can. And as you know, um, what they say, a fed bear is a dead bear. Because once a bear learns to associate humans with food, then they might harm humans. Because it might come up to you and go, where's my sandwich? And you're like, I don't have a sandwich. And it goes, <laughs> and then, you know, eviscerates you and you're gone. And then the bear is gone. And it's a sad story. But anyway, this is not the best picture. But it's a young bear. And he looked kind of weird because he's a black bear, but he had really, really blonde hair. And it was very long. And, uh, but, and, you can't tell, but he's digging in a, I'm so proud of this bear. He was digging in a stump and looking for beetle grubs and tearing it up. And the reason I was really proud of this bear is because across the street was the visitor center and they have food there and they had like fried chicken and it smelled really good and I could barely resist the fried chicken. And here's this bear not going after the fried chicken in the dumpster, no, no, no. He's like digging in a, and I'm like, wow, what a good bear. <laughs> he's digging for things he should be digging for. So, anyway. Um, also, basically, uh, keeping your camp clean. You know, no food particles out because it attracts animals. And that's more for your safety. Well, as both for your safety and the animal safety. Um, but animals will chew a hole in your tent to get to stuff. Uh, or they'll come in and pee on your sleeping bag or something like that, and I really hate that. So uh, don't leave any food in your, in your uh, tent and make sure everything's packed up and put the waste securely at night. Um, pets. I love animals, but sometimes if you want to see wildlife, don't take your pet with you. And, um, you know, or keep your pets on a leash and things like that. But, and the idea is this, you know, you might have an animal tromping through the grass and you're watching it. And, and you know, some people's dogs are great and they'll just sit there and watch the coyote go by or a deer or something. But some dogs are not like that and they will chase it down and kill it. Or just chase it away. And this bird, you guys know what bird this is? Woodpecker. It's not a red woodpecker. It runs on the ground. It's a really long time ago. It's a roadrunner. And I took this picture in Wildwood with the biology club. And the reason we were able to see it so well is because we were, A, quiet, we didn't have a dog with us, you know? And um, this roadrunner, what they do is in the morning, and this was in the morning, they have a black patch of downy feathers on their back, and then the other feathers that cover them, they lift it up and they, they put their back to the sun and they get warm by the sun. Even though they're warm-blooded animals just like us, they get more energy, they save energy by letting the sun warm their body rather than burning up their fat. Does that make sense to you guys? So a lot of birds do that. And, um, and then he was jumping up on a rock, and you could tell it's a favorite, well, I guess it's like him, but if you see a lot of white uric acid or bird shit, that's a good place for it to find birds. Um, but he was also calling for a mate. So it was a really cool sighting. Um, this is at Moro's, uh, Moro Bay, and this is a big sand spit. And there's a do not enter. And what that sign is for is there are snowy plover birds breeding on the beach there. And so they have it all cordoned off. And it doesn't, they don't cordon off all the beach, but they do cordon off a lot of the beach. But this um, area is five miles long, and not very people visit it. So it's, it's a pretty well-preserved area, and it's a good place. It's not a high traffic Zuma or, you know, Point Doom or something like that beach. Anyway, snowy plovers are beautiful little birds, but they're kind of stupid. <laughs> and they lay their eggs right on the sand. And their eggs look just like the sand. So if you're walking along, you know, you wouldn't be able to see their egg at all and stomp on it. 
that's their nest. They don't really have a nest. So they have to cordon areas off with the snowy plover. And um, so there's lots of area here that's for snowy, snowy plover. But one of the side benefits of coordinating off with the snowy plover is that the plants that live on the beach are very delicate to the foot, foot traffic of people. And you know, if one person steps on a plant, it's not bad, and another person, you know, 10 people step on the plant, it's fine. But, you know, any more than that, you're gonna crush and trample the plant because the plants have what we call prostate growth. They grow flat because they're like holding down the sand. You see how these plants are all growing flat, they're not tall? Because they have a problem with their sand blowing away. So, and, and anyway, so when people step on them, it cuts them up. Anyway, um, and this is another thing to consider about why sometimes you don't want to take your dog with you. Uh, no dogs on the beach. This is a very, you know, very beautiful beach. And the reason they don't want the dogs on the beach is because of the snowy plover breeding area. Because a lot of people that take the dogs and get off the leash, the dogs run around. And uh, it might run, you know, to the area where people won't be, and it could could pick up an egg or a chick or something like that. Because again, the snow plovers just breed right on the sand. But what do you think? This is kind of a remote area, and there's usually no patrol. What do you think people do? They bring the dogs. <laughs> and um, but anyway, check this out. No kite flying. And it's like what? That doesn't seem like fun. But at, you guys might have read already. This area is a critical habitat for the protected western snowy plover. Kites resemble hovering hawks, which may frighten the birds off their nests. And repeated abandonment will harm the chances of nesting successfully. And so, you know, once you explain to people, I think people are cooperative, you know, but I didn't know that. And when I first saw no kites, I was like, what? But now it makes sense. And I'm like, I can, I can fly my kites. <coughs> um, but another thing for you guys to consider, when you go to the beach, and you see lots of birds on the beach. Some of those birds are local, but a lot of those are migratory birds. And some of the birds just flew in from Bolivia, one way, 8,000 miles, no stopping. And they land on the beach, and they're like, oh my god. <laughs> and they're like looking for food, you know, like the, like the plovers or the godwits and curlews and things like that, the shorebirds. And they're poking through the sand and looking for little things to eat. And if, you know, you go to the beach and go, there you go, Sparky. <laughs> Sparky runs after them and scatters them up in a big cloud. They fly away, which is what they're meant to do. But you don't know that that bird didn't just come in from a very long flight. You know what I mean? It needs a break. So it's, you know, for enjoying nature, it's important to control your critters. Um, never feed animals. I see this all the time, and you, you know, you guys probably see this too about people, uh, you know, especially like in Yosemite, they feed deer, and they're very beautiful, the deer are friendly. But the thing is, deers, if the deer thinks you have food and you don't, and it kicks you, it can also eviscerate you because they have very sharp clothes. But it's not good for, for deers to, or for any animals to get habituated to human food because it's not their food. And it, um, they lose some of their, natural fear of humans, which they should keep, All right? So feed, oops, feeding wildlife damages their health and also their natural behavior. So here's an orange, and that orange is about three inches across. So look at that rodent there. It's a big one. You guys see it? That's a pack rat. What about like feeding chipmunks and squirrel and nuts? No. <laughs> you know what? They do fine on their own. They do fine on their own. And since we're on that topic, um, you know, you know how they're really good at campsites. You know, talk about be bear aware, and they like give you a whole spiel about the bears. You're like, okay, I get it. You know, well, a couple years ago, I went to a campsite, and um, the parking area was a little bit farther away from the campsite than normal. It wasn't like just right there. You had to walk. And I popped open my car, and I, you know, like grabbed my tent and dragged it down to the walk back and get my season bag and everything. Well, my car doors are all open and my car got invaded, not by bears, but Stellar's Jays, you know those that have the top notch, you know what I'm talking about? Stellar's Jays. And squirrels and chipmunks were all in my car and all going crazy because my car's very messy. <laughs> and eating whatever and, you know, shredding up things and where, you know. 
you know, I was like, what? Well, get out of my car, you know? And uh, it wasn't the bears you had to worry about. It was every other creature, every other creature. And um, I love squirrels and chipmunks and stuff like that. But you don't want to feed them because they do harbor fleas that have bubonic plague. And then if we can jump on them and bite them, give you bubonic plague. But it's not good for them. They don't need to learn to eat from humans. They have plenty of seeds and things to eat. <laughs> but anyway. Oh, okay, too much. Uh, in a trail, excuse me. Um, this is super important. When you're walking on a trail, have you ever come to a part where it's muddy, you don't want to get your shoes wet, and you go off on the side where it's dry grass or dry mud, you know what I'm talking about? What happens is the trail gets wider and wider and wider and wider, and then this happens. But you don't want this to happen. Get your feet muddy and just deal with it. Because you don't know what could be growing here and here, because this could be growing there. You don't always see it. Or that could be growing there. Or that could be growing there on the trail. Talk about that. <laughs> So um, anyway, camp on hard surfaces. Uh, when you have a campfire, this is super important. Keep it small. And look at how close everybody is when it's small. Because you just don't want to burn. You just don't need to burn that much wood and put that much CO2 in the environment. And you guys may or may not know, some areas have burn restrictions because the smoke is too much. The other thing is, uh, people get excited and want to make a bigger and bigger and bigger fire, and then they start looking for things to burn, and then they start gathering wood. And um, was, so they might grab downed wood, but this downed wood <coughs> is home for somebody. This piece of wood, you know, is like a lizard that lives in there, and it's slowly decomposing and leaving nutrients for these plants. So you don't, you want to bring the wood that you're going to burn, not gather. And you guys see it, don't gather wood. They say it all over, don't gather wood, don't gather wood. And I've seen people take live trees and try to break a branch off and burn fresh wood. Anyway, so be careful with your fires. Um, when you see historic things, leave them be, just enjoy them. If you find cultural things, just put them back where you found them and report them so they can be enjoyed by other people. Uh, be considerate to other visitors. What I really want to focus on is let nature sounds prevail. Alloy, avoid loud voices and noises. I love loud, crazy music. I like it when my back vibrates. <laughs> but that's in my car. But in nature, I want to hear the birds singing and the frogs croaking, and sometimes I don't want to hear anything. And it's beautiful just by itself. You know, you don't need music in the nature. And so leave nothing but footprints. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but this is a cat footprint. And it's over four inches because that lighter is three inches. So that's a mountain lion footprint. And we picked it up, of course. <laughs> Those are our footprints. But that's a mountain lion footprint. So leave nothing but footprints, take nothing but pictures. And so basically what I've been talking to you guys is about leave no trace principles. Have you guys heard about that? Leave no trace? Yes. Good. Anyway, um, if you want to learn more about it, you can look at it online. But the deal is this. There are almost 40 million people in California. And they go camping a lot. Because I go camping a lot. And I see them. And you know, in order to preserve what we have, and we have so much beauty, we all have to work a little bit harder. So we have no trace. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like us to take a five-minute stretch break, and then we'll have the second part of our
So I have a picture here. I'm, I'm an avid surfer and uh, prone paddleboarder as well as being an artist and an active activist. Um, do we have any surfers here? Um, so I've been surfing for almost 20 years, and um, I grew up in Chicago sailing and swimming on Lake Michigan, and so when I came out here, I um, you know, immediately had to find water, and uh, surfing was just, you know, it's an obvious match for me. And one of the things that I expected when I got here was to find this Eden that everyone had been talking about in the surf industry, you know, these beautiful beaches, warm water, you know, camaraderie, you know, whatever. And all I found was, was trash everywhere. Um, one of my first experiences was having a, a snap wrapper hit me in the face um, when I was paddling out, uh, as well as the wave, too, but just a lot of trash and trash on the beach and trash floating in the water. Um, I learned to dive uh, shortly thereafter and I found trash underwater. Um, it just was incredible. Um, I learned to surf just after grad school, and some of the first projects I worked on played around a little bit, not so much with trash, but just with some of these sort of hidden dichotomies that I found in the surf industry. Um, the first one that I encountered, and this is the first project I did, this was a, uh, exhibited at the Laguna Art Museum as part of the uh, art history of surfing. And this was a multimedia piece where I, um, I worked with my husband, and he's a, he's a physicist who does a lot of programming. And what I wanted to do was uh, have a piece that talks about the experience of surfing and the emotions, or the heightened emotions that come up when surfers get together. And clearly we don't have that many surfers, but our one person who sort of surfs <laughs> might relate to this, that it's very hard to get people to agree on where to go. We have a lot of places to surf in Southern California, and everybody has their own one particular spot that they want to be at. And, um, and I was, uh, you know, watching these surf movies like Annette, uh, Annette and Frankie and seeing how happy everybody was. But at a closer examination, a lot of these films, especially between Frankie and Annette, they fought a lot. And so I had my husband write a program that would parse data from two major buoys that were used for surf forecasting. Uh, we had a northern buoy. Um, that brought in all the information about northern swells and the southern buoy that brought in information about southern swells. So this is the, the southern buoy, this is the northern buoy. Um, and swell heights, we, we had the program basically organize a uh, beach party, this classic 60s film, based on surf heights. So if it was zero to three feet, which is not a good surfing day, Annette and Frankie fought in the film. The film was edited together, so they were fighting the whole time. Um, between four and six feet, they were kind of okay, happy, and so they were, you know, they were interacting peacefully with one another. And then anything over six foot was all the beach party scenes. And so, and they were hooked up in the museum, so they were pulling actual real-time data. So as people were coming into the exhibition, they could watch the film based on what the swell heights were out of these two buoys. Um, and so the emotions were being played with, and this was something that I was interested in. Um, and I did a lot of other work, so I'm going to keep this fairly brief. Um, another piece that I did explored uh, the, you know, the sort of deteriorating environment around me, um, not just as a surfer, but as a camper um, and hiker and just all around explorer. And the summer that I was working on this piece in 2007, uh, Steve Fawcett, I don't know if any of you remember who he is, he was a, a billionaire adventurer um, who you know, tested different types of airplanes and so forth. And his, one of his planes crashed with him in it in somewhere in the Nevada, California border area. And it took a long time for people to find him. They did finally find him. And I just, it's, it struck me as sort of an odd situation because here's this person who's pushing the boundaries and I'm very interested in, in adventure, but there's always a price to pay. Um, you know, they were going through all the debris um, and, you know, sort of echoes of, you know, this recent plane crash that they're still looking for and all of the, the debris is another issue that's coming up again. Um, so I produced this piece called The Missing Adventure and this is a large installation that was at Sea and Space and some of you may work with Lara Bank here at Moore Park. Um, professor, she's an adjunct professor here. Um, but this was her gallery for a while in uh, the Highland Park area. Um, and it's a, a large paper installation that basically follows 
uh, different types of adventures, um, starting with uh, a stadium here, and then down through this tube into a forest. And I don't have a lot of detailed pictures, but the forest is deteriorating, and then over into rocklands, and then into ski areas, down into finally ending with a seabed with a, a sunken ship at the bottom. Um, it was about texture. It's about a lot of the formal uh, issues in art, but specifically, it was about you know what happens to adventurers. They don't always make it. Um, as I started to surf more and make more work, I started to make work about literally pollution in the water. Um, and this was something that I was seeing more and more often. Um, and I was seeing a lot of pollution that was actually a direct result of the surf industry. I was finding leeches in the water, I was finding broken surfboards, I was finding wax wrappers, um, the snacks that surfers brought to the beach. Um, and I started to see all of this floating in kelp, and I uh, started to make some pieces that sort of addressed, you know, this kind of impoverished nation of, of creatures, you know, that were ultimately not benefiting from all of the things that were making us happy. Um, and I also produced some pieces that just basically dealt with my own sort of, you know, nightmare of the California dream. Um, this is actually just a model of my car with a surfboard just completely crashed <laughs> and leading out in some ways. Um, I still continue to surf. I, I'm a prone paddleboarder. I'm training for a Catalina crossing this summer, and so I'm out in the water all the time. Um, and I also, in the time I was making these pieces that we just looked at, I had a, a, a boy, a little baby boy, and uh, he was born in 2005. And as he's been growing up, I've been trying to expose him in a way that's loving uh, to some of the problems that he's going to encounter as an individual here on the planet. And one of the things is trash um, and our you know, addiction to convenience. Um, so I have a couple questions for all of you. Is how many of you produce trash today? Great, good. Honesty is good. <laughs> so if you're not sure, um, just think back to waking up and having your first meal. Oh, I'm stuck. Uh, oops. Okay, so we're jumping ahead. So maybe pop tarts, maybe yogurt. Um, you might have had a drink. You probably had a napkin to clean up any spills. Um, Maybe you've lost your teeth. You might have opened up a new package of soap. You may have taken your dog for a walk and picked up poop in a little bag. You may have pooped your dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of this adds up to trash, and it adds up to a lot of trash. If we think about just what happened this morning, and how many days we lived during the year, and how many years we've lived, and how many years we're going to continue to live. Um, these are all things that we need to consider. And so when my son started preschool, one of the things that I wanted to do was to try to get environmental groups to come in and talk to his preschool class. And for many of you, I don't know if you know, preschool usually starts with about three years old. Um, and there was incredible resistance to coming in and working with children that young. Um, and so a friend of mine and I got together and we decided that you know we were teaching things at home that were working. Uh, and so why couldn't we develop a program that would help you know, introduce children as young as three years old to some of these ideas and test it out? So we got a grant from Surfrider Foundation and we wrote uh, Plastic the Real Sea Monster. And my friend's name is Nancy Hastings. She refuses to have me put her name on anything just because she was the facilitator. She actually officially works for Surfrider. Uh, didn't benefit from the grant, but helped me to, uh, to put everything together to, uh, to do the program. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of the pitch that we give to preschools um, as to why it's important to come in and do a project like this, um, and it's going to, you know, feed into what the project actually looks like, how the days are spent with the kids, um, and then I'll I'll end with some work that I'm doing now that's uh, kind of in direct relation to what I've learned doing the project. Um, one of the first things that we do is we, you know, express to these children that they live on this sphere that's 75 percent water. And it's home to not only us, but also some of the largest creatures on the planet, like the blue whale, as well as some of the smallest um, microscopic organisms. Um, and the ocean is incredibly important because we get oxygen from the ocean. So it's not just from the forests here on land, but we also look at the forests in the ocean. Um, and the forests in the ocean, such as kelp forests, uh, produce half of the oxygen on our planet. So it's very important to maintain the health. Um, 
I looked at my son and you know he was pretty you know pretty inviting to hearing this information, but there were times that he gave me some you know some hard times in, in getting him to understand and so we looked at you know why would we want to work with little kids? They can be really, really tough. And some of the things that parents and teachers asked us, um, you know, why, and this is some of the reasons why environmental groups wouldn't want to work with the little kids, is that one, they wouldn't understand what it was that we were talking about. Um, they might get scared. This was a big one. Parents came to us a lot saying, you know, I don't want my child to be scared. Um, they also didn't feel the kids would pay attention. Um, another big one was that, and this mostly was voiced by parents, that, you know, why should we burden our children with these issues? Um, and then another one is environmentalism is, is dirty and can be dangerous um, when you get out there and you're picking up trash. And that was sort of what everybody thought we would be doing. Um, so we counteracted with a bunch of, you know, things that we knew about learning. Um, one is that we knew that kids learn through play. Um, and, that, and that's fun. And if you're having fun, you tend to learn more. In fact, I've learned more about physics and brain biology through surfing than I ever did in the classroom. <laughs> but stuff sticks with me. Um, I have these deferred learning experiences probably in the classroom. Um, children also, just from day one, begin to learn responsibility through routine, and that was one of our goals. Um, they also are very uh, interested in making logical decisions. Um, they're also natural nurturers. Um, so we wanted to play with all of these things, and, but most importantly, we wanted to play with every child's dream of being a superhero. Um, and we felt that that superheroism was incredibly important because of the burden that they were going to inherit from us and all of our ancestors. So we started out with a really simple concept. Um, we basically looked at what was clean in their lives and what was messy and what were the benefits of things that were clean and what were some of the drawbacks of things that were messy. And they got it. They were like, clean, we find our things, you know, and when it's messy, we might get hurt, we can't find things. Those are all really important. We looked at the beaches that were messy, and we looked at beaches that were clean, and they got it. It was immediate. They're like, well, animals can't find what they need. Maybe it's food, and they might get hurt. Uh, and that they really want to have a clean environment to play and live. So the next thing that we approached was really, look, how does the beach get so dirty? You know, I asked them, how many of you guys litter? None of them litter. How many of you litter? <coughs> Couple people litter back there. <laughs> okay, so we know that the majority of people have learned that if you litter, that's a really bad thing. Not only are you going to get fined if you get caught, but it's just you know socially unacceptable to do that. So what happens? Well, we've got storms here in LA, so people put their trash into their recycling bins. They put them into the trash cans on the beach, etc. But the storms are a big menace. You've got wind and water. Wind can blow over a trash can. The trash can's full of trash. The trash gets into the storm drain by the rain washing down the street. It washes, it, it looks clean after a rain, but all, that's just because all the garbage has gone into the storm drain. Um, storm drains also clog with trash. Um, the trash that actually makes it into the storm, storm drain actually ends up in the creeks and rivers that um, pull the water off of our streets. And then those creeks and rivers lead to the ocean. We do have these nets that are set up, but these nets are only set up for a certain amount of capacity, and if you take a look at them closely, when they do get filled with trash after what's called the first flush, um, they usually won't unhook them, and then, because they'll break if they don't. Um, so these nets only serve a purpose to a certain point. And once it's in the ocean, it, it, it gets caught up in these things called gyres, which we were talking about, where we have five known major gyres. Um, we have the North Pacific Gyre here, which is our gyre. We have the South Pacific Gyre. We have the Indian Ocean Gyre, which is getting a lot of news these days. Um, we have the South Atlantic Gyre and the North Atlantic Gyre. And these are major currents that are pushed by wind and, um, and waves. And they basically work like if you spin a spoon in a glass with, like, say, oval teen or something in it. And as you're spinning it and trying to have it disperse evenly, it's getting caught in the middle in this vortex. So all of this trash that's on the beaches that waves grab and pull out, it gets sucked out into these big swirling masses of water and the trash floats and also sits just below the water. So you can be out in the ocean and you can look out and it can look perfectly clean, but if you go underwater, you start to see where all this trash is accumulating. Um, 
And a lot of it is on the bottom. And one of the things that a lot of people don't think about is that, you know, the food chain, you've got tiny little organisms eating this trash and then bigger organisms are eating those organisms and so on and so forth. So the stuff builds up in toxicity with the higher, you know, organisms on the food chain. So when we get our sushi, you know, one of the things is that, you know, maybe we're not pulling out plastic bits, but there is, you know, pollutants in our fish. And animals are eating them. Um, and this is really where the kids start to respond. They don't really think about sushi <laughs> so much, but they think about these animals that really can't tell the difference between trash and their food. And this is a sea otter chewing on a, a six-pack ring, um, thinking that it might be a mussel or, or some sort of shellfish. So we, um, we would show this type of presentation to the kids the first day, um, do a lot of Q&A with them, answer questions and so forth, and then we would get into sorting. So two weeks prior to coming into the classroom, families were given a list of things to consider at home, things that they put in the recycling bin, things that they didn't know, couldn't go into the recycling bin, just basically anything that was plastic in the house that they might be getting rid of, like a barrette or a DVD or something like that and to collect it, things that, that they would be normally throwing into the trash and to bring it to school. And once it was at school, the kids started to sort it into small, medium, and large. And they loved that. They could do that all day long. Once we had sorted it into um, small, medium, and large, we had our second day we started to build. And we started to build a creature. Um, the second day was really the narrative component of this particular um, project. And that is that when we think about trash in the ocean, we have to think about it as something that is dangerous um, and that is scary. And when you think about things that are dangerous and scary, essentially, oops, I'm out of sync. Um, essentially we're dealing with things that are a monster. So I'm gonna jump through some of the other images that we showed. It's got a little out of sync, I apologize. So we've got a, a heron here with a bag caught on its beak. Um, we have a sea lion with a bag around its neck. Um, we've got the classic story of the sea turtle that eats jellyfish, and if there's bags or plastic floating in the water, it's very hard for them to distinguish between the plastic bag and the jellyfish, and if they consume the plastic bag, then obviously they're not getting nutrition, um, and they can starve to death. Um, also, that can get entangled in their intestines and their system, and they can just die from that. So, here we are um, looking at the, the plastic bag floating in the water and the jellyfish. And when we ask about the damaging effects of it, we ask, you know, is this like a monster? And they all agree, it is like a monster. Um, and then we'll ask them if they've ever seen a monster. And a lot of the kids will say, well, we've seen like sharks and eels and deep sea anglers and crabs, all these things that are really scary in the ocean. And we took this as an opportunity to actually educate the kids that these are not things that they should be afraid of. These were all animals that need to be respected. Um, great white sharks, obviously, you're not gonna go running after them or swimming after them to pet them. Um, then they're formidable predators and you wanna stay out of their way. Eels are the same way, octopus, um, crabs, even on the beach. Um, and most people won't even see a deep sea angler because they're so deep in the ocean and they're really not very big. Um, but a lot of kids really believed in sea monsters. And um, when they thought about sea monsters and we talked about what a sea monster actually was, we looked at this image and asked them what, you know, maybe someone might have been mistaken in seeing. And a lot of kids came up with very close connections to maybe an eagle or an eel. Um, and we wanted to reinforce once again that the trash was the thing to be afraid of. And ultimately, we ended up with these monsters made out of trash mm -hmm. in the classroom. Um, this was the very first one that we made at Home Sweet Home's preschool in Culver City, and we named it Stormy after the storm rains. <coughs> Excuse me. And so in two days, we went, <coughs> we went from a pile of trash to this sea monster. And then at the end of the project, we didn't want to keep the, the trash as, a, as a, an art piece. Um, and that's different. That's how this project is very different from other um, trash projects, is that the entire idea was to take a look at what we're producing as consumers, make something that becomes a symbol for the school and for the community, and then to properly dispose of it. So the sea monster would last for maybe a month or two with the intent, <coughs> intent that it would be disassembled and then properly put into recycling bins and disposed of. And 
we um, and then sometimes we cut the head off and give it to the class to to put on a wall like a you know like a mounted deer head like this thing mm -hmm. that they had conquered, mm -hmm. um, and and that was a fun thing to do. Um, in addition to that, we talked a lot about um, picking up five for pride, um, and that's kind of a rule that I have with my family is that every time we go anywhere, we pick up five things, five pieces of trash, and take it home. And if everybody was to do that, we would have a much cleaner planet. Um, we also let people know that, the kids know that if you put something in the recycling bin, it generally is keeping it out of the landfill, and this is a good thing. And if you put something into a black bin like that, it will get sent to a landfill, and landfills just basically accumulate with trash until they're full, and then they're covered up, and, um, and that's the end of it. And they're incredibly destructive in terms of toxins leaching into the environment. We also encourage students to reuse a lot of the things that they had, so maybe a pair of old boots could become a planter, maybe old magazines could become a play uh, structure. But the most important thing we did is really talked about this idea of refusing and to use um, products that don't that could be washed and reused over and over again. So the point was to really point out the single-use packaging, um, anything that you open up for that one single serving and then throw into the trash. Um, and it's this incredible convenience, and for parents, it's, it's like a miracle to be able to have cheese sticks individually wrapped to throw into the lunchbox. You can get a lunch packed in less than five minutes, but the repercussions on the environment are astounding and incredibly damaging. Um, so the big message really was to refuse. And one of the ways to refuse or to get used to it was to have a waste-free Wednesday when everybody makes an attempt to bring a lunch that has absolutely no trash. Um, and kids love doing those types of projects. And what they end up finding is that it's really not that hard <coughs> and that they can do it over and over again. So the refuse was the big message uh, that we were trying to give. Um, I have now a bunch of images of different sea monsters that we've done, but I've done this in, uh, we've done over 80 sea monsters, and the project is officially retired now. Um, as an artist, I feel like I need to move on with new projects, but Surfrider has asked me to try to get it all written down into a teacher packet, <laughs> and that's a really tough thing to do with a full-time job and a kid and so forth, but, um, but that's where we're at with the sea monster project, is that we're trying to train people to do the project. So if any of you are interested, um, talk to me after the presentation and I can put you in touch with the right people. Um, this is a project, this is one that we did at the Santa Monica Pier Aquarium. Um, the face part in the middle was eight feet tall and the hands were about this tall. You can kind of get a sense of scale from the boot. This is a man's boot right here. I like to use it as a finger. Um, this was done with the Art Institute of California. Um, and this was done by college students, this was an eel. Um, and this was brought in just from one lunch um, that was done, a luncheon that was done for the project. And so this was all the single use packaging that was brought in for that lunch. Um, and they didn't know that they were being kind of duped. <laughs> they told them to bring a lunch and everybody brought this stuff from like various grocery stores. Uh, this is another um, sea monster, I'm kind of partial to the uh, kind of Viking ship sea monster. Um, here's one of the heads that's used on our Facebook page. Um, this was a cute one from uh, Temple of Kiva Preschool. This is a slimy the snail. They really wanted to do a snail. Uh, and this is from uh, Oberlin School. Uh, this is in the process. It's a giant slug uh, that's about 10 feet long. And it was installed on the grass. Um, I've also done puppets. I'm very interested in puppets. This is a kind of like a Chinese dragon, New Year's dragon. Um, this was used in a number of the Ban the Bag uh, campaigns uh, before the bag was banned. It didn't really come, which is really great. Um, some of the teachers have continued with some of the leftovers to make smaller pieces with the kids. And, um, and now I have a few pieces that I've done recently that um, deal with this connection between the ocean and the land. And what I'm really interested in as an artist now is looking at the relationship between dwindling spaces for both people and animals and that intersection and, and the conflict that happens there. Um, this is a piece that's from the, uh, the Armory Center in Pasadena. I did a collaboration with Lara Bank, uh, who's also in the show. Um, she had a, a, a nursery, a plant nursery that was a hydroponic nursery, and I had a, a small little Kentucky Fried Chicken model. Um, the, the restaurant here that had been taken over by a rookery of uh, elephant seals. 
So it's sort of this imagined post-apocalyptic uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken drive-through um, when the seals had taken over. Um, something's lost, something's gained, but it brings up a lot more questions. And as the installation was evolving, I just started to have the sea lions swim out from my piece, and then they kind of took over Lair's piece, and they started to destroy some of her plants. But you can see here, they're starting to, well, they're also shrinking in size, and then they're all over her plants. They look almost like a, a disease um, taking over the trees that she's planted. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm really interested in puppets, and Um, I took a, a bunch of sketches, sort of photo collage sketches, to um, Denmark. And uh, while I was in Denmark, I was really interested in learning about the Selkie mythology. And this is a, a changeling uh, story that any community that has a re relationship with sea lions usually has stories about how sea lions are really people. Um, and the classic Sel Selkie story is that a sea lion takes its skin off, buries it, and it's a human, and lives on land. Um, they're pretty complex stories, sexually, as well as um, just in terms of animal-human relationships and hybrid relationships. Um, what, I, what I like about the, the human uh, sea lion changeling is that it can be a great ambassador for what's happening in the ocean and what's happening on land. And so I've created these marionettes and puppets that um, are communicating to the sea lions. This is one, this is the marionette, surfer marionette, who's got a puppet. And the puppet is the Streptococcus A puppet, um, which is a waterborne disease. This is the, the strep that actually causes the flesh eating um, syndrome where people have, you know, gangrene that starts. They can get it from having an open wound in the water. A lot of surfers are prone to it. Um, but I've made E. coli puppets as well as a Pseudopachia puppet, which is a neurotoxin uh, that uh, happens uh, kind of naturally occurring when there's a red tide. And, Sometimes you'll find a seal on the beach that's having a seizure as a result of this particular neurotoxin. So this selkie here is talking to a seal. Um, and as I said, these are, are collages. Um, I've also taken um, some of the sculptures. This is, I have an obsession with, uh, with field, um, what are these called? <laughs> bleachers. bleachers. <laughs> Something about bleachers, maybe it's my high school. Like I, cool things happen under the bleachers, scary things happen under the bleachers. And bleachers are just really fascinating to me, and so I've taken a few bleacher sculptures and inhabited them with sea lions just because they're kind of absurd and, and fun. Um, and then my last image, uh, the second to last image here, this is the, the Selkie puppet once again here, but she's been opened up to look a lot like the midway birds that are filled with single-use plastics. Um, so I'm working on these, this puppet show vignettes that teach the same sort of ideas that the Sea Monster Project taught. Um, not geared towards little kids anymore, I want to have them be geared towards adults. Um, and the puppets are life-size. This is one of the puppets that I'm working on. This is just a working drawing of an elephant seal puppet and kind of the mechanics inside. Um, so I have a lot of things that are work in progress. Um, and. And that's it. I, I never know how to end one of these things. Um, it always feels very awkward. <laughs> but if you have any questions, okay. do you have any questions now? Or uh, or yeah, have, I thought maybe I would do my presentation briefly and then we would have questions at the end. Should we do that? Can you hold your questions that you might have for Amy? Okay, so should we give her a hand? Yeah. Cynthia Manette, and um, I'm so glad that Amy covered a lot of the territory about the uh, plastics in the ocean and that whole situation, so I can shorten my talk a little bit and take some of the things out so that we can still be able to remain on schedule. Um, I wanted to show you some of the work that I've been doing using plastics in my sculptures and how the early work that I've made kind of has led up to the pieces that I have now at this Jire exhibition that I was telling you about. 
So I started this project in uh, 2009. I was asked to participate in a show that was next door to a recycling facility and it was a nightclub in Italy and the uh, curator when I had said that oh well I'll participate with small porcelain sculptures which is what I had been making at the time he said well it's a nightclub and they may get trampled and uh, people who do work here usually use the recycling facility next door and gather their materials from there and make their pieces from that. And I thought, oh, well, that would be really interesting. Um, so I came back to the States and I started working with plastics. I went straight ahead to the 99 cent store and found some things that I could use. So this is the first in the series. It's a pig. Um, it is made from recycled plastic bottles and some bowls from the 99 cent store. And it was followed by the emu. So the unsustainable creatures, the whole sort of premise behind the series of sculptures is that I want to talk about domesticated animals and how domesticated animals are, can kind of be a parallel for the way that we as humans are domesticated as well, in that we're domesticated to using plastics, we're domesticated into our jobs and into our chores, and that there's quite a similarity between the way that um, we look at the planet and the way that animals are being used by us. So the emu, um, with lights inside, LEDs inside, the bull, Ferdinand, this is a small, it's like a small model of a bull, which later I moved into making larger pieces, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, the vulture, so the vulture is the only non-domesticated animal and is usually set up in an exhibition to be the predator in relation to the other animals. So the vulture sort of waits on the wall and um, is looking for the animals to run out of electricity so that they can be consumed. Uh, so after I had the first exhibition with the small pieces, I was asked to do a solo show at Woodbury University and I wanted to include a larger animal, so I started researching the posture of horses and what happens when horses roll and then stand up. I was very interested in my work to go for the anatomy first. I usually build um, the structure based on the skeleton and the muscles and the postures of the animals and then I find materials that will uh, reflect the right kind of um, limbs and everything. So as you can see here there's a there's an exercise ball for the belly, and there are uh, various other, this is a large water container that's cut into two parts here to be able to make the chest muscles. Okay. So following the life-size horse, there's the life-size camel. So you can see that their postures are kind of in moments of struggle, they're kind of, um, not just happily running along free. This camel gets down on its knees to accept a load for somebody then to ride it. Um, and so this one, the larger the animals get, the more, uh, the larger pieces I had to incorporate into them. So all of these pieces actually, the camel, the horse, and the ones that are coming up now are going to be in an exhibition which opens in a few weeks at the Museo in Anaheim. So you'll be able to see the four large animals and the vulture on display there. Here's a detail of the head of the camel. LED lights inside. Um, baby bathtubs on the ox. There's a team of oxen. So baby bathtubs here, these are the inserts if you ever do the laundry and you look at the inside of a laundry detergent bottle, there's that plastic spout. That plastic spout can be pulled out and I use that to create the tail right here. So I recycle from the dumpsters around my house and friends give me 
uh, things that they've recycled to incorporate into my sculptures. So here is the ox. The reason why I'm using the lights in the sculptures is not just because it makes them glow and makes them look beautiful, but also to draw a parallel between um, how inextricably bound to using electricity we are. So that again, you think if the animals are surrogates for us humans and they're made out of plastics, then it shows how we are also, by dint of the food chain and the plastics in the food chain, how animals are becoming part plastic, we are becoming part plastic, and we can't stop using electricity. Everything around us here, we have to use electricity. We wouldn't be able to see my slides if I didn't have a computer hooked up to a projector. If the electricity wasn't working, we'd all be sitting here in the dark, right? So that's kind of why I have that element in the pieces. Okay, so the first ox, and I was invited to do an exhibition at the Huntington Beach Art Center, which is right by the sea. And I thought, well, I'll make a second ox and I'll talk about marine debris and I'll make a whole sort of swath of plastic bottles that these oxen are pulling behind them. So this is all recycled plastics um, and a plow that these two oxen are pulling. Here's a back view. I had a chance after that show to show this work again at um, UC Riverside. They have a very beautiful exhibition space and I was able to really stretch the pieces out so that you could get a sense of scale and uh, the camel was included in that as well. <clears throat> Um, after that, or at the same time, I had made a proposal which was accepted to show my work at the airport at LAX in the international terminal. There's this display case, it's 43 feet long. So I started making the animals for that exhibition, and since it was commissioned a couple of years before it actually happened, I was able to show these various you know, components in other exhibitions along the way. So we've gotten a lot of mileage out of these pieces and it's been great because they've been going from place to place. I don't have to store them for too long in my studio because they're quite large. So this is at the airport. Um, I added the elephant. This is called Packing Caravan. I wanted to have, you know, international travelers be able to relate to the animals. When I was researching, I found that years ago, uh, people thought that maybe they could introduce camels as a domesticated animal in California. So that's why I had included the camel and then the elephant, of course, was never introduced here in California, <laughs> but is definitely a beast of burden. Uh, so when I was installing the work, it was so fascinating. People were walking by and they were able to identify the animals i uh, able to identify what type of elephant it is, since it's an Asian elephant, different from an African elephant, and what type of camel it is, because it's a dromedary. So I was really happy to have that kind of response. So here's the elephant, uh, Gladys. She's the biggest beast I've made so far. Um, after the show came down from the airport, uh, the elephant moved to another space, an architecture firm, for several months, which was great. And now, you know, she's in my living room. She is the <laughs> proverbial elephant in the room. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, she's going on to the museum in a couple of weeks, as I said. So, um, while I was working on this piece, a friend of mine sent me a link that I'm going to try to show you right now. She said, you might be interested in this exhibition. And this exhibition was happening at the Anchorage Museum in Alaska. And she said, check this out. And so let's see if I can show you there what I saw. It's just going to take us a second. It's going to here. It's going to here.
don't you hate when that happens? <laughs> so I had it all loaded in and everything. This whole project is unusual, but we're also in not only unusual times, we're in unprecedented time. The plastic has been accumulating here basically ever since we started using plastic. It's predictable where the trash will end up. We took 40 tons of plastic off these easy gradients. These are the ghosts of our consumption. Exactly how to do this. Let me make sure. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> okay, so I wrote to the curator, and miraculously, she wrote back and said that I couldn't participate on the expedition that they were doing, but that she would be interested in my work for the exhibition that they were putting together. And so um, I proposed that I wanted to make a series of pack dogs, uh, huskies, particular for Alaska, and um, they invited me to come and exhibit them. So here I am at the Anchorage Museum with these other artists in the show. So this is uh, Alexis Rockman. This is Pam Longobardi, Andy Hughes, and Deanna Cohen. And they all have work which has to do with these <coughs> various issues. So I wanted to show you some examples of their works as well, and then I'll show you the packed dogs and we'll be done. So um, this image that you see behind you of the shed bird was taken by the same artist, Susan Middleton. And this photograph, she went to the Midway Atoll, which is part of the Hawaiian archipelago, and it is where the albatross, uh, the largest you know, proportion of albatross is in the world, and their bellies are full of plastic. So she made photographs of the contents of one belly of one albatross that died from ingesting all of this plastic. So I'll show you some of that. It's horrifying. I mean, the thing that was amazing about the exhibition uh, is that the works document, they document the horrors, but the way that they're presented are so beautiful that it helps you to see that there's a part of a solution is through education and through making something which is beautiful. Um, it is sticking, isn't it? That's weird. So Alexis Rockman is based in New York City, and he does these paintings of this kind of post-apocalyptic world of animals that are affected <coughs> by genetic modification, views that are both above the water and below the water, as you can see here. Pam Longobardi uh, collected ocean trash from the Hawaiian islands and from the beaches of Alaska to make this cornucopia. It's a very large piece that is a different kind of bounty than what we would expect in the Horn of Plenty. And uh, it's all buoys and nets and various things that are taken off of the uh, directly off of the beaches. And Hughes is based in uh, Britain, in Cornwall, and he photographs, he uses Photoshop, so he photographs the objects to make them look like they're these sort of uh, otherworldly creatures. He was really funny. He's just a character with a British accent, and he was just really a kick to hang out with. It's really fun to meet the other artists in the show. I didn't meet this woman, Sue Ryan. She's based in Australia. She wasn't able to come, 
but she works with a ghost net organization. So ghost nets are fishing nets that are abandoned at sea and continue to fish even though they have been left behind by the fishermen who are supposed to collect the fish from them. And so she works with this organization where Aboriginal artists from Australia are working together with um, other artists to be able to create things anew from these ghost nets and it's bringing a lot of uh, attention to their situation. So she made this wonderful dog. Deanna Cohen is based in Los Angeles. She started a whole um, program called the Plastic Pollution Coalition. And she, her message is very much the same as what Amy was saying. And in fact, she says that she knows you. Um, to say, uh, to add the fourth R to refuse, no, reduce, recycle, reuse. reuse, and she says refuse should be the last one because she says your refrigerator is full of plastics. And, um, I have a short video I was going to show you, but I think I'll just skip over it because we have the same information from Amy. But she works with plastic bags to make these beautiful stone constructions. Okay. So I started making the dogs. Um, wanted to make a suite of okay, five dogs pulling a sled. And so here they are in my studio before they got packed away with my cat. Someone said when he came to see them, he was like, does your cat know that those are dogs? <laughs> Funny. Okay, so I just wanted to show you the process because I've never had my work professionally packed this way before and shipped such a long distance. And it was such an honor for me to have people come <coughs> with huge crates and a truck and pack everything carefully and ship it all the way to Alaska. So this is the truck outside the studio with the crates. This is one of the packers lovingly packing the dog, one of the dogs. Here they are going into the crates. Here is the Anchorage Museum in the first week of February. Very beautiful in the snow in the morning.